Welcome everyone to our weekly COVID-19 Q&A with Toronto's Associate Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Vanita Dubey. Thank you so much for joining us again today. Yes, thanks for having me. Absolutely. My name is Dilshad Berman. I'm a writer and reporter with City News and City News 680, and I will be moderating this chat today. If you haven't joined us before, the way this works is we've been collecting questions over the past few days for the doctor via our social media, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and also our website. Um, and uh, we will present them to the doctor today. She's never seen them before. She's going to answer them off the cuff. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance to submit your questions, you can still do so in the live chat in this broadcast. And we're going to try to get to as many questions as we can. Now, when I say moderated questions, I just mean that I've arranged them in a way that makes sense. So we have a little bit of flow in this chat and related questions are asked one after the other. Um, so we're going to start with our testing questions. Lots of quest questions about PCR and rat tests. Um, and so we're going to start there and then we'll move on to vaccine questions. But if you have any other questions in the meantime, please send them to us live and we'll try to get to as many as we can in this short 30 minute period that we have with the doctor. So doctor, we're going to start with testing questions. Are you ready to go? Yeah, let's go. Okay, wonderful. Let's get started. Uh, we're going to start with Lori's question. Lori asks, does the rapid test detect the Omicron variant and the Delta variant as well as other variants? Okay, so that's a good question. We know for the Omicron variant, it's shown that the rapid test, uh, if it's positive, can be quite reliably be positive for the Omicron variant. Okay. Um, Delta, it worked as well too. We can't be sure about future variants. I think when there is a new variant, then the test uh, manufacturer checks, does tests to see if that test can detect a new variant. Okay. Um, and then Alice's question, Alice says, when a person is seven days past when they became symptomatic, can you please clarify what a positive rat means, a rapid antigen test? Are they still contagious? Yeah, so we, it's hard to fully understand whether the test means contagiousness. And I think the tests are so simple, they're not quite so one-to-one. -one. What we do know, some of it will depend on is the person vaccinated or not. We know that when you're vaccinated, you uh, clear the virus quicker. And so if you get a positive test, you're less likely to be positive. Now, what we are assuming, though, is that a positive test means a, a recent infection. And so uh, for most people, it's based on time in terms of when they can go back to their activities um, and when they're considered at least less contagious, mostly um, not contagious. Okay, okay. Um, so essentially, sorry, so just, just to clarify then, if the person is seven days after, like they've finished off their symptoms, it's been seven days after they're symptomatic, if it's a positive test, they're most likely not contagious. If they're unvaccinated, they probably still are contagious. Okay. Um, and that's why unvaccinated um, have to isolate for longer for 10 days. Or if they have a weakened immune system, again, um, more likely to be that they still are contagious. Okay, okay. Uh, that's an important distinction there. Um, let's move on to Ray's question. Is it true that rapid tests will read positive for a long time, uh, for a long period of time after infection? Um, it was to my knowledge that only PCR tests did that, but many are arguing otherwise. Yeah, again, we're still learning a lot about Omicron, but it seems with Omicron that the rapid tests can turn positive and then turn negative uh, within a few days. Uh, and we are certainly using that. You'll see that there's um, guidance out now that if you have symptoms and you have two rapid antigen tests that are negative, you're considered uh, cleared. It's not COVID. If you've had COVID uh, and say you work in what we call a high risk setting, like a long term care home, that you can use those kinds of tests, uh, to, like a rapid antigen test, and rely on the negative to, to, for some sort of clearance. Okay. Uh, and then let's take some live questions coming in on our website here. Uh, Rachel asks, is there a plan for making rapid tests more widely available? It seems incredibly ineffective to expect everyone to isolate based on symptoms alone with no testing available. Yeah, good question, Rachel. And I think we'll have to wait to, from our provincial uh, colleagues, uh, the provincial government, to, to see what their plans are for rolling out rapid antigen tests. They have certainly announced that in schools they'll be giving each student two tests uh, to take home. 
um, for testing if they have symptoms. Again, you might ask, well, why two? Well, if you have uh, symptoms, if your child has symptoms, you do one test, and then 24 to 48 hours, you do the second test. If both of those tests are negative, your child can be cleared and can return uh, back to school. But that's only in school, right? In terms of widely available to the public, there hasn't been a plan that's been announced yet regarding rats. I have not heard a plan about that. Certainly some workplaces have access to this. Again, those higher risk settings are the ones where we're trying to focus a lot of testing resources to kind of prevent the vulnerable from getting very sick. But yeah, we'll have to stay tuned to, uh, to, to our, uh, the province, what the province announces. Okay, um, let's jump into some YouTube questions. Geosonic asks, what are the recommendations for immunocompromised people? How can they see other people safely or do they have to isolate until there is an Omicron quote unquote patch for Pfizer? Yeah, it's a good question. I think everybody should really do what we call their own risk assessment. I know that kind of sounds very vague. What does that mean? Well, if you're immune compromised, uh, severely or, or you know on very strong drugs you should have made sure that you had three doses of vaccine for what we call your primary series and then you should get your booster dose in your case your booster dose is your fourth dose so i think that will give you better protection if you're going to meet with people make sure that they are vaccinated try and do it outdoors you know wearing masks you wearing a mask will help to continue to pr protect you especially a high quality fitted mask so um i think each person who's immune compromised really does need to figure out how they can keep public health measures in place to, to further protect them right right um okay let's take another one from youtube javed asks what is the immunity duration for those who have had two vaccines and then had Omicron after the fact? We don't really know. Um, you know, again, we've had Omicron for weeks and weeks and weeks, not even for, for, for many, many months. And so it's hard to know how long your immunity, if you get Omicron, will last you. Right. In general, we have said, uh, you know, if you get a previous COVID infection, we know the immunity can last for 98 days. But I can't say, say more than that. Is it going to be less than that? Is it going to be more than that? Right. Okay. Uh, and then actually another question from, uh, from Geosonic. Um, as Omicron sits higher in the res respiratory tract, does this mean people with IgA deficiency who don't have IgA in the sinuses means that their symptoms will be more severe? Yeah, I don't think that we, we really uh, have seen specific, like go, going into that much detail in terms of people being more at risk. Right. We certainly have seen, that's why young children are, are more at risk uh, and are getting more sick from this because they rely on their upper airways, their nose, their mouth. If you've had a baby, you know, if their nose is plugged, it's really challenging for them. And so uh, we have certainly seen how that has, has played a, a part uh, in making some people uh, get more sick uh, compared to other variants. Okay. Um, okay, let's take a few more live questions. Lots of live questions coming in. Um, Dana asks, this is from our website, how will you speed up the registration process, which is weeks long right now, for vaccinations that are received outside of Canada? I understand this is possibly a, a provincial question. Yeah, so each health unit uh, inputs that data, and so I can't speak to every health unit, though knowing that there certainly is an effort to get to get this caught up. Okay, um, and let's see, what else do we have? I'm gonna tackle a couple more live questions. Um, from our website, Luciano asks, what does unknown vaccine status mean in Ontario hospitals? Are those patients vaccinated but not registered in the database? It can mean, usually it means two things. Either they are unvaccinated um, or they are vaccinated and not registered in the database. But if you got a vaccine in Ontario or got it registered, it would be in the system and would be noted as being vaccinated. Okay. Uh, and then another one from Arena, um, sorry, that's our website. Uh, Jimmy asks, is there any data uh, in terms of case counts of children aged five years and younger how many contracted Omicron and the severity of it? I'm very anxious. I have no choice but to put my child in daycare. 
So that those numbers certainly are being posted uh, by age group. Uh, you can see it nationally. You can also see it for Ontario and uh, locally. I think one thing to note is it's hard to actually rely on the case counts now. I mean, uh, we've we we aren't testing as much as we were so so one thing that we look at is well how sick are some of those younger children getting and we have certainly seen uh hospitalizations they're still low in this age group especially compared to other age groups but compared to other variants um yeah some of those younger children are are getting more sick uh, and ending up in hospital okay um, and then actually speaking of daycares, Jeff has a question. This is from our submitted questions over the past few days. Um, how come daycares are never addressed in the policy announcements? Kids under five cannot get vaccinated, cannot get PCR tests for them. Um, so with any symptoms, they automatically have to quarantine for five days. Um, how are parent, working parents supposed to cope with this? Okay, so when it comes to public health guidance, the guidance that we get in schools applies also to daycares. Um, and so uh, we'll have to wait to see further announcements about um, daycares in terms of the, the, the rapid antigen test, will they, whether they will be available there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, that we heard that yesterday for sure. Um, okay, and then another live question from YouTube here. Uh, Cameron asks, are the schools providing students with two tests, like individual tests, or two test kits, which is five per kid? So my understanding is the provincial government is giving school boards two tests, not test kits, so right. two and tests it. for each child. Um, and that they will be distributed by the school to the child. Okay. Um, and then, uh, Doctor, last week we talked about, this is about uh, vaccine booster doses. Last week we were talking about booster doses, and uh, you mentioned that it's preferable to take the same brand that you took for your second dose for your third dose. Why is that the case? I know that you can still take any brand depending on what's available, but why is it preferable to take the same brand? Okay, good question. I'm not sure that it's preferable. I think it was just if you had a choice, you could match it with your second dose. So whatever you had for your second dose, you could match that for your third dose if you had an option. Um, and they, in the beginning, they were they were doing that because the supply for both was equal, and they were trying to balance out who got what. But it certainly is not a, a, a actually a preferable thing. Okay. And I actually think that there's even more data that the Moderna vaccine may actually uh, be a better vaccine than Pfizer. There's a lot more research coming out uh, about that. Um, and so I certainly would not recommend that people wait to match their vaccines uh, if, uh, because we do still have uh, Pfizer for the 29-year-olds and under, and then Moderna for the 30-plus. And as I said, Moderna is, is, is probably a better vaccine than even Pfizer. And Pfizer is a very good vaccine. Yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so there wasn't any sort of um, particular medical reason why you had to match the second dose to the third dose. No, it wasn't. It it wasn't a specific medical reason uh, per se. Like again, the 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 vaccine doses can be interchangeable, and it was made at a time when there was a abundant supply of all vaccines. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. Um, and then let's just jump back into some of our submitted questions again. Um, ben asked that we've been talking about this. Where do we get the rapid COVID tests? So, uh, you know, I, I think there are still some available for purchase, although I think a lot of people are not quite interested in that. Um, beyond that, uh, it will, it's up to the, it's to the provincial government who has the rapid antigen tests and is rolling them out. The, the goal right now for testing is to have the tests available in those high risk settings. Like really what we're trying to do is to prevent Omicron from spreading from spreading rapidly in places where people are very vulnerable and could get very sick from it. And so that means places like long-term care homes, right. hospitals, shelters, that kind of thing. Right, okay. Um, and then let's move on to Cami's question, um, more about testing. Uh, after testing positive for COVID, when is the best time to do another rapid antigen test, provided you have access to them, to determine if you are still infected? once symptoms have begun to improve for 24 hours or once you are symptom free? So I wouldn't recommend routinely doing um, testing to see if you are, you know, not shedding or not infectious. It's, uh, the tests themselves, um, 
are can't necessarily be be used that way and so if you know after day two you test negative does that mean you're clear you don't need to isolate no so the minimum isolation is the five days and then you know if you work in a long-term care home you're required to isolate for 10 days again we want to make sure that you're fully cleared of the virus but after five days seven days for example depending upon um uh, on what the occupational health and safety says, the employee could do a test uh, and based on the results, consider going to work. But it's called a work self-isolation where they're wearing their mask, they're never taking it off, they're making sure even when they're eating that they're not. And so those are the times when we're doing test-based clearance. But for most people, that is not something that I would recommend. So they just do, if you take like one rapid antigen test, it's positive you isolate for five days if you're not a long-term healthcare worker. Um, and then- And if you're vaccinated. And if you're vaccinated. If you're not vaccinated, it's 10 days, correct? Yeah. Right, okay. And then after that, when when are you considered clear to, to leave isolation? Is it 24 hours after the symptoms stop or just 10 days and you're good? So if you're unvaccinated, it's 10 days as long as your symptoms haven't been improving for 24 hours. Okay. And if you're vaccinated, it's five days, as long as your symptoms have been improving for 24 hours. So if at day six, your symptoms are still the same, you're not cleared from isolation. Okay, that's an important distinction for sure. Um, okay, and then let's move on. Um, more live questions, uh, one from YouTube. Are you worried that there could be a homegrown variant here in Canada, given the influx of Omicron cases here? Um, and is it likely that it would be more severe or less severe than Omicron? <clears throat> Yeah, so I rely on our, you know, lab partners. They do a lot of genetic testing, sequencing of the virus to help, dis you know, help us determine is there a new variant on board, for example. I think what we are seeing with Omicron, we're seeing it actually around the world, right? The U.S. is in the same situation, Europe as well, too. And so to say that it's something specific to Canada, I'm not sure that based on the numbers and the impact that that's necessarily the case. Right. And, but is there a chance, is there a worry that Canada might get its own variant? Well, you know, I, I think the worry is that there could be another variant that takes off around the world. I mean, we've seen that this variant, <clears throat> it, it was first detected in South Africa and has now impacted the whole world. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I, so I don't think we really have to be so concerned about a particular country per se. We have to actually think of the whole world as, as part of, of, of being concerned about variants because what happens around the world really does impact uh, the rest of the world yeah absolutely um okay and then uh, let's go let me, sorry i'm just going to check our website here we go tim says why does the messaging and vaccine mandates focus on spread um when it's not fully supported sorry i maybe i'm reading this out live so i'm not sure um, yeah yeah so I think what we what we knew when we had the Delta variant was that if you had two doses, you were less likely to get Delta, you were less likely to spread it. Right. What we know with Omicron is that if you've had two doses, you can actually still get infected. We know if you're infected, you're going to get a milder infection. Uh, by having a milder infection, you will spread it less often, but you can actually still get infected and and spread it. And so, but what we do know is with that third dose, that booster dose, that's where we see evidence for preventing infection and preventing a transmission uh, as well. Uh, but it is still less compared to what we saw with Delta. Okay, um, let's jump back into our submitted questions, more about testing. Uh, Karen asks, without testing, do we need to isolate every time we have symptoms? Is it possible to have COVID more than one t once a month? Yeah, so great question. So yes, so the way that, so the way self-isolation works is if you have a symptom, um, one or more symptoms of COVID and the, the symptoms have changed on the screening tool. So we, we, for example, at Toronto Public Health have posted our child screening tool, our staff screening tool. It's the same symptoms for both children and staff. If you have one or more symptoms, you isolate. 
if you had tested positive on PCR, you isolate. If you tested positive on rapid antigen, you isolate. And then you isolate for the same amount of time regardless. Now, if you have symptoms and you have access to rapid antigen tests, well, if you do a rapid antigen test today, your symptoms are improving. You do another one 40, 24 to 48 hours later, both tests are negative. Well, then you can be cleared from self-isolation. Okay. Um, and then, and just as, and then the last part was, can you get this? Can you get Omicron every month? I don't have an answer to whether you can get Omicron again. What, what we do know is that if you've had COVID, the chances of getting Omicron are high. That a previous COVID infection is not really preventing an Omicron infection. Right. But what I don't know is, can you get Omicron again? Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then another question from our website, Raghu asks how many days from being COVID positive do we have to wait until we start testing ourselves on rapid antigen tests as part of a routine asymptomatic testing at a workplace? We want to ensure that employees aren't screened as false positives on rapid antigen tests as a result of residual viral load. Yeah, so these are all very good questions. I think part of it depends on, well, where do you work? What kind of work setting is it? Is it a higher risk setting or a lower risk setting? If it's a lower risk setting, you may decide to save the rapid antigen tests for only people who have symptoms and not to test, uh, do um, asymptomatic uh, surveillance testing to prevent, to prevent this type of situation. But in general, um, some of it's going to depend on when are the symptoms improving. And again, uh, you know, there are guidelines in place for, for considering um, testing for clearance, for example. Okay, and Dr. Where can we find those guidelines? Just on Toronto Public Health website? Yeah, the, pro the provincial government has uh, guidance for high-risk settings for, um, for clearing um, uh, test-based clearance uh, uh, on that, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, and then we'll jump back in again to our submitted questions. We've got a question from, both of these are from Twitter, Rebecca and somebody whose handle is Pink Ranger. They have this, a similar question. Um, how will individual schools know when there's an outbreak warranting closing the school when no data is being gathered regarding positive cases um, determined through testing or symptoms? How will I know when my children's school has become overrun with cases? Okay, so from what I understand, uh, schools will be reporting absenteeism rates. And so what that means is, you know, if the school has uh, 100 students in it, 10 people are away, uh, that's a 10% absenteeism rate. And so they will be re reporting that uh, daily. And that is what will be used to uh, determine whether um, there's more likely to be, for example, more spread, They're going, the, the absenteeism rate. Now we don't have firm details on how that's going to be done. Is there going to be a threshold, that kind of, of thing. Yeah. But the real, the, real, the real goal in schools, for example, is if someone has symptoms, should not come, should stay home. That's a, a really important measure um, as schools reopen on Monday. Okay. Um, and then uh, another question here, if the rats are only for symptomatic students and staff, do they expect those people to come to class to get tested or to stay home and then never use the test? So the rapid antigen tests that will be um, uh, sent out by schools, my understanding is they will go home with students. And so the right. student should, who has symptoms, has done the screening, has symptoms, not going to school, should do the test at home, absolutely at home, should not go to school with symptoms. Mm -hmm. There is a, a provision that if a student or staff develops the symptoms when they're at school. They were fine at 9 a.m. and by 12, they're not feeling well, they've gotten a fever. Mm -hmm. If the school has those take-home PCR test kits, uh, the parent could collect that uh, 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 to have that sent um, uh, and then the child goes home. Okay, um, and then this is, a, I, this is more of a provincial question, doctor, but perhaps you can give your opinion um, on YouTube, Jay asks, do you feel like Ontario will follow Quebec's lead in mandating boosters for the vaccine passport? 
it's, you know, it's really an impossible thing to answer. Yeah. Um, and so I think we'll just have to wait and see what our provincial government decides. Right, absolutely. Um, because so far, doctor, we've been talking about, I know currently indoor dining is closed and things like that. But so far, when we were talking about vaccine passports, we said it's the two shots that are required for any sort of activities. And the third shot will be added to your passport, but not necessary to do these various activities when they're allowed, right? That's right. So the third dose will show up when you get your um, receipt. It will be on there uh, if you got your vaccine in Ontario. Um, but right now, the vaccine certification uh, process does not uh, take, in, take into account that third dose. Third dose. Okay. Uh, wow, we're so running out of time here. All right, let's move on to uh, Jackie's question. Jackie asks, how is removing testing and reducing isolation times going to reduce the spread of COVID-19? Yeah, it's, I, 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 I understand uh, your question. And I think what we have to recognize is uh, we're at a place where we have an awful lot of COVID spreading. And so when we end up with the percent positivities, when we test uh, 30%, you, you know, or higher, uh, really, we have to then realize, recognize that we don't have the testing capacity. In fact, I, I've heard even from my colleagues who are other physicians got tested seven days ago, it took seven days to get their PCR test results. Wow. So we really have to ask what's the utility of testing in that type of situation when there is already a lot of COVID um, spreading. And so really, we just have to assume now, if you have symptoms, that it, it is COVID, unless you have a test and can get a negative test. Uh, so that's the situation that we're in right now. Yeah, I think, I think I had the same question as well. And I think, unfortunately, the situation is that bad. There is so much COVID that if you have symptoms, you just assume it because we just don't have the testing capacity. At last count, and this is a, an old count, I think we were 100,000 tests behind in terms of backlog and I, that, again that was an old count so um it is frustrating from a from a lay person's point of view for sure but i think um yeah that the guidance is just if you have symptoms just stay home it's better not to spread it um yeah and you know you know what if i could just introduce this concept containment versus mitigation now these are very complex words but up until now in the pandemic we have been using case and contact management and testing finding a case isolating around um and to try and really prevent further spread and we have made tremendous success with that right we saw with uh, with wave uh, three the alpha wave and then the delta wave can actually contain spread like that but with Omicron, because it spreads so much, your ability to test and isolate and trace, uh, you, it doesn't actually work that well because this virus spreads so easily. And so that's why, because of the Omicron variant, we have to think about what we call mitigation. And that means preventing the infection from really causing a lot of severe illness in those who are, are most vulnerable. And so that's why the approach is to offer more testing, more support in long-term care, hospitals, uh, shelters, that kind of thing. Right. I think, I think what's for me, especially to even understand is that the system can't keep up. Testing can't keep up with the number of cases that are happening. So we just have to kind of do a blanket. You have a symptom, stay home, don't get out, you know, till you, till you feel better, basically. Just assume that you have COVID. That's right. Yeah. Right. Okay. We have four minutes. So let's jump into Cami's question. Cami says, now that the isolation period has been shortened to five days from 10 for vaccinated people and with PCR tests unavailable to the general public, um, before returning to work, must people be symptom free at the five day mark? Or do they have to be with improving symptoms within 24 hours? I feel like we just talked about this. Um, yeah, so they have to complete the full five days. Yeah. And at the end of five days, and just to note that the day your symptoms started is day zero. <laughs> That's okay. not day one. That's day okay. zero. Okay. That's good to know. And so at the end of five days, your symptoms have to be improving for at least 24 hours. It's actually 48 hours if your symptoms were nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Okay. Then can you be released from self-isolation? Okay, so it's probably safe that if, if the first day you have symptoms is day zero, plus five days, that's six days, plus two days of improvement. So you go up to about eight days or so to actually be clear if you're feeling better. 
if your symptoms last for five days, I mean, some people say that after two days, their symptoms went away, right? Oh, okay. And so by day five, it's been 24, 48 hours and their symptoms have either gone away or improved. Okay, okay, makes sense. Okay, um, let me see if we have any live questions coming in. No, we're good for now. Let's jump back into the submitted ones. Mezia asks, um, as testing is not available, can you tell us what we should do at home when everyone, adults and children, are sick with fever, cough, and cold? Should we just assume it's COVID? A call to the clinics uh, uh, says that uh, we just have to take Advil or Tylenol. Is that the best uh, we can do? Is there anything else we can do? Yes, so definitely have to assume it's COVID and isolate. Now, of course, if you need medical care, seek medical care. I mean, if anyone's having trouble breathing, they're unable to keep fluids down, they're not responding, you know, absolutely seek medical care. Right. Uh, if you have a baby and they're tugging up their ears, you're not sure if it's the ear infection. I mean, there certainly can be other things that are going on. But for the most part, for we are assuming that, again, anyone who has those respiratory symptoms, uh, or, actually, there's, there's nine symptoms to watch for. If you have any of those COVID symptoms, you stay home and isolate. And we didn't talk about this. Actually, everyone in your home also has to stay home if someone right. in the home has symptoms. Right, absolutely. Um, and then doctor, in terms of what to take at home, is there anything special or is it just Advil, Tylenol, the same stuff that you do for a cold, lots of fluids, all of that kind of stuff? That's right. Over-the-counter medications, uh, it's really important not to get dehydrated. So that's why the fluids are really, really important. The over-the-counter medications like acetaminophen, like ibuprofen, if they're safe for you, they will help you feel better. And that might help, to, you know, keeping you drinking fluids as well. Okay. Uh, and then let's just do this last question here. We haven't even gotten through our testing questions, let alone vaccine questions, but let's take Aldo Aldonza's question. How can they send kids back to school with no testing? Why does the class not need to isolate anymore when it has cases in it? Okay, so I think we've talked about testing will be uh, available for students if they have symptoms at home. Uh, in terms of isolating the class, so in the classroom, uh, everyone's wearing masks. They're, they're cohorting, they're uh, keeping as much physical distance as they can. So there are, are other measures. You, they're screening every day to make sure no one with symptoms comes to class. So there are a number of other measures in place in the classroom to keep the classroom from having Omicron spread right through the whole class. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's uh, one of the reasons why if someone in the classroom has uh, Omicron test positive or has symptoms, the whole class will stay uh, together, does not need to isolate unless someone has symptoms. Okay. All right. Okay. That brings us to one o'clock. Thank you, doctor, uh, for taking all of those questions. Thanks to everybody for submitting. We have so many more left that we're going to try to get to in the coming weeks. Thank you for the live questions as well. We appreciate the interaction. Um, for now, uh, we have to say goodbye. It is one o'clock. Uh, so we'll see you all next week. Thank you so much, doctor. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.